Thank you for joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce Eric Schell to kick us off. Eric? Thanks, Benson, and, and good afternoon to many. Good morning to some, including Jeremy. Um, um, thank everybody for taking time out of their afternoon or morning and, and, and listening in on this presentation around the USDA program and its new free financing program. Just, uh, just, just briefly, you know, the, the, this presentation is going to define two paths for clients interested in, in refinancing existing debt under USDA. Uh, the first is creating a refinancing savings to reinvest in a larger new capital project, and the second is a more traditional refinance to improve cash flow and reinvest savings into operations. Um, uh, Ultimately, Stroudwater GCL works with rural healthcare clients to access this capital, and so that's kind of the introduction. What I want to do now is, is, is before we get into the presentation, just introduce the panelists that we have here today. So, so on the left is my colleague Brian Hoppala. Many of you know Brian. Brian and I, um, beginning in 1998, started our rural practice at Stroudwater, and uh, Brian is 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 back now um, in the family, and um, uh, he served as a trusted advisor to healthcare executives and boards for over 20 years. Uh, yes, he started when he was 12, um, with a focus on developing sustainable healthcare systems from operational financial improvement to capital investment. Um, over his uh, career, he's led hundreds of co clients, projects in strategic facility master planning, strategic planning, turnarounds affiliation engagements for clients in every region of the country. Uh, his, his one real passion is around securing capital investments to modernize the aging rural healthcare infrastructure and increase quality, high value services for rural people and places. A true need right now is, is evidenced by the pandemic here over the last 12 months. Um, on the right there, that good looking guy is uh, Jeremy Gilpin. Uh, Jeremy is Executive Vice President of Commercial Lend uh, of Greater Commercial Lending. He has a background that includes more than two decades in the banking industry. He has extensive experience delivering guaranteed lending through the USDA, BNI, REAP, RSA. Who, who thinks healthcare has a lot of acronyms? Um, USDA 9003, IRP, RLF, and a whole bunch of other alphabets in here. Um, throughout the, the past 20 years, he has closed and serviced more than 900 million in loans. As head of the Greater Commercial Lending Team, Jeremy directs all aspects of this division in providing lending solutions to companies. Prior, he has led the development and implementation of all commercial services for Greater Nevada Credit Union, the largest USDA business lender in the U.S. And, and so, uh, and then and then you have Eric Shell. Um, I'm, I'm chairman at Stroudwater, and and I come in in the morning. I empty the dishwasher. And so, so, so with that, um, I'd like to kick off with the agenda for the day. Um, um, first, we want to kind of set the context for facility investment and drawing back on studies that Stroudwater had began in 2004, where we looked at the impact of a replaced facility on the finances, operations, um, staffing, economic development, et cetera. Um, our most recent study was done in 2016, and we're going to show some results from that just to kick off and set the context for why we want to actually access USDA or capital or actually explore refinancing options. Um, then Brian and Jeremy are going to get into the specifics of, the, of, the, of the, um, the new refinancing program, which really came out, um, there wasn't a lot of um, <laughs> whirlwind around it, primarily because we we're, we're embedded in this um, pandemic. And, and so there were some pretty decent changes to the program that these two gentlemen are going to share with you. So with that, let's, um, let, let's, let's, let's talk about the context for, for accessing capital right now and, and in the past. So back in, beginning in 2004 through 2011, for seven years in a row, Stroudwater looked at all the critical access hospitals that had been replaced. And we presented at the, at the National Rural Health Association's annual conference every year. Um, um, and then we held off for a couple of years, and then we updated the study in 2016. Uh, stay tuned, we're actually updating the study again 
for all the new hospitals that have been replaced from 2016 to 2020 with a study that's going to come out this spring. So, but um, what we looked at is is any any critical access hospital that had its entire clinical operations replaced, and they had to have been in operation for 12 months prior, so that they had some some operating experience in the first year out, um, um, and 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 really to identify we uh, the hospitals that had been replaced we actually went to all the state office of rural health directors and asked them for a list of hospitals that they were aware of and then we went to the costreportdata.com and pulled in any information that showed a large capital expenditure on the balance sheets and then we referenced the the, the, the websites etc to determine all the replacements so that's how we came up with the the, the the hospitals to be included in this study next slide brian here in our 2016 study, this was all of the critical access hospitals that have been replaced. There's 172 of them by, by, by this, in the 16 study. And um, um, you can see we're all over the country primarily. Next, next slide. So some of the key volume takeaways. Um, and, and again, a critical access hospital replaced at least all of its clinical operations. And, and the cohort that we want to focus on is the cohort on the left. So this is a look at patient volumes. Um, and, and so the numbers that you see, acute and swing bed days, which is the first row, and if you go all the way out to the far right-hand column, thanks, Brian, uh, what you'll see is, is the experience around patient volume, acute and swing bed days in the first row, and then adjusted patient days in the second row, pre-replacement, and then post replacement. And the post replacement is for three years post replacement, the average annual annualized growth was 2.7%. So year one after replacement volumes on average for the 47 hospitals that were made up of this complement was 2.7%. Then the next year it was 2.7% on top of that, the, the prior year, and then 2.7 on top of the next of that year. So pretty significant growth. Um, adjusted patient days, that number was 3.8%. Now, the, the, the importance of adjusted patient days, it also is a reflection of your outpatient services. So on average, investments in facilities for three years post-replacement generate average annualized growth of around 3.8%. Next slide, Brian. All right, you, it's, it's all that writing you're doing. Uh, the next is taking a look at operating efficiencies. So, you know, we say, hey, you, you, uh, you know, what happens when we replace? Uh, we looked at um, FTEs. Um, if you go out to the far right-hand column in the first row, FTEs, on average, post-replacement, to, to, to care for that growth in volume, there was a 2.1% average annual increase in FTEs. The next row, I think, is the most important, where it's the FTEs per adjusted patient day. So even though the hospitals, on average, are increasing their staff, there is an improvement in efficiency because the, the, the volumes are going up faster than the staffing, which improves efficiency. And then the last is operating expense for adjusted patient day of up 1.8%. Now, you know, think about you know, that. There's inflation in there. Um, there's the cost of the depreciation and interest of the debt, of the, the depreciation on the equipment, but then the um, interest on the debt, all included in that operating expense, and it only goes up 1.8% a year. Pretty, pretty impressive. Next slide, Brian. Uh, profitability, uh, I think the, the most relevant is I EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, and amortization, which is the second row which shows that, that overall the you know, cash flow from operations improved 12, um, by 12.7%. By Days cash on hand fell because on average, some of these 47 hospitals that are in this cohort um, invested some of their capital into their facility. Next slide, Brian. And, and what now I want to just want to just touch on briefly, and it's more for impressions to tee up than the broad, the bigger conversation around uh, 
the the, um, the 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 USDA free financing program is is back um, in the earlier studies, 2009 and 2010 studies. Um, when we originally were doing these, Brian and I would reach out and interview CEOs of hospitals that had been replaced to more get the, the, the qualitative side. That was the quantitative side. The qualitative side, some of the specific questions that we asked had to do with volume, impact, provider recruitment, um, staff recruitment and retention, quality performance improvement, economic development. And, and the next couple of slides are really just a, 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 a collection of comments that we heard. Um, as these CEOs wanted to share their story about the replacement. So just, you know, from a volume impact, um, you know, just look real quickly. We have suppressed all expectations for volume growth. We are now expanding, building, and doubling our parking lot. We experienced a 20% growth in, in both inpatient and outpatient volume. Um, surgery volume has skyrocketed with the recruitment of an orthopedic surgeon. Our swing bed census has grown. Um, you know, here's one we projected to lose 300,000 in one year. Um, with growth and volume, we made money in the first year. Really incredible results. Next slide. Uh, around provider recruitment. And again, here's here, you know, for, for impressions, um, medical staff satisfaction skyrocketed. Recruited an FP in, in 2009, contracted with another FP who, FP who will finish uh, school in, in, in July. Uh, we've got an offer out for a general surgeon, just recruited a third year resident. Um, um, we have increased from five FTEs, F, family practice physicians, to nine F, uh, family practice physicians. Um, our, our orthopedic surgeon, um, Orthopedic surgeon recruited out of a tertiary uh, center said the OR is here better than a, a university. Again, incredible. You know, one of the conclusions that, that Brian and I came with that, that a facility investment is, is a physician recruitment strategy. Um, next is staff recruitment and retention. We now have op no open nurse positions and using no travelers. We are uh, fully staffed with people knocking on our door. Our turnover rate has dropped. Um, um, we we used to be constantly we used to constantly have a revolving door for nurses. Now no open positions for RNs and LPNs. Having nurses drive now nurses drive 30 miles to work for us. Never happened before. Really incredible results around staff recruitment and retention. Uh, and then the last is is around. Uh, well, actually, then we have uh, second to last is quality improvement. And, and you can just see from 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 some of the some of the information here um, that that scores. I like the the one right here where prior to our new facility, patient satisfaction scores were below the 10th percentile in the ER and 80th percentile in inpatient. We reached 99th percentile in the new facility. You know, so clearly clearly positive impact related on quality and performance improvement, which is going to be critical competitive advantage going forward. And the last was around economic development. And um, the um, you know ultimately that that how important a new hospital and the investment in that facility is to the community. Uh, you know, uh, open new K through 12 school, new hospital contributed to voters uh, to pass new school. Combine these, combine these, attract new families. Um, um, uh, there was one, yeah, 20 acres, three blocks north of the hospital, just acquired to develop a community center. Large parcel across the street has been cleared by private develop uh, for for medical space. Again, significant community investment um, with with an expansion and, and reinvestment in the hospital. Next slide. And, and so the conclusions um, coming from the um, from 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 this really were that that the quantitative information showed that on average an investment facility resulted in pretty significant growth in both inpatient and outpatient services at least three years post-replacement. Um, when we update the study for uh, 2020, we're gonna look at beyond just those three years. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Growth in FTEs, we're able to recruit new people, new staff to our organizations. Um, um, you know, some cash improvement, um, and, and, and ultimately, you know, again, this, this whole idea of, 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 of investment in facility, many of which use the USDA program, has um, have, have, have enabled this, this, this competition around the triple aim, improving quality, um, um, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know the, the, the having you know, the physicians, the care of the physicians, and really just in, um, you know, a, you know, great investment for 
for the organ of the community. Next slide, Brian. At this part, you know, again, that was to set the context for, for um, you know, the importance of facility investment. And, and now both Brian and Jeremy are going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, drivers and the, and the actual the USDA, the new program that, again, went under the radar uh, due to the pandemic in the, in the last 12 months. So, Brian, you want to take it from here? Absolutely. Thanks, Eric. And I just want to note for our friends that are on the call, um, in the last number of years, Eric, I think you've actually matured in the sense that you didn't take up as much of the time that we had allotted. Uh, you used to uh, take up all of my time, um, you know, because you'd go first. So we'll buzz through the rest of this and really build on, I think, that great message that USDA is out in the community supporting many of these projects, Eric, that you just referenced. And I love looking at the data and seeing the impact that it's making in the community. Um, but today we're going to shift gears to another aspect of USDA's commitment to the industry and to our field by exploring the new refinancing program and really look at the main reasons that folks would, would want to refinance. This, the first and ob most obvious is to be able to generate some savings and we can do that really by lowering the rate um, considering that rates in today's market are at historically low levels. So we can lock in those low rates for uh, you know, a long term. And then, um, you know, to that point, we can also re-amortize the loan, uh, extend those payments out to create annual cash flow savings that, that, to your point, Eric, given the pandemic expenses can be really beneficial to many of those folks that have made these investments in the past. Um, secondly, um, and importantly, um, we can free up cash that may be restricted by the existing lender. Um, uh, it's a little bit easy for us to pick on the HUD program just in the sense that they have a two years debt service requirement. Um, so there's you know, quite a bit of cash that gets set aside on the balance sheet that's restricted and we, we can't have access to. So you know, we can free up some restricted cash that we're re refinancing through this program. And then thirdly, uh, and it might not be on a lot of folks' radar screen, but Really, uh, I think one of the advantages of the USDA Community Facilities Program is that it comes forth with really not uh, very restrictive covenants. So debt service coverage threshold, as an example, um, you know, that's the amount of cash that we need to be able to generate in excess of our annual debt service requirement. Um, that is a lower threshold within the Community Facilities Program than in other aspects of the marketplace. So. We have some additional flexibility. Um, there are uh, fewer restrictions, certainly in comparison, again, to the HUD program around any changes to finance properties and the approval process associated with that. And then in terms of regular reporting, um, it's much less onerous. So in terms of looking at um, the way that we accomplish refinancing under the community facilities program, um, option A that you see listed here has really existed for a long time. That is refinancing as part of a new project. So we can use um, existing, the, the refinancing of, of, of existing long-term debt to offset a new capital investment. And when we're able to do that, we can combine the direct and guaranteed loan programs, um, assuming that the uh, applicant is eligible from a um, direct loan that would be fewer than 20,000 people in the community. And, and combine those two sources of capital together essentially into a package that utilizes some of those savings to offset some of the new investments that are being made. Um, but really importantly, um, you know, I think as another, uh, as another tool here, uh, we're now able under the program to do straight refinances that are really more focused on uh, simply improving cash flow um, and I say simply, um, it's very important in today's marketplace for the reasons that we've referenced around, um, you know, expenses associated with the pandemic. But um, under this program, the current program rules require that that's funded with a guaranteed loan only. And these are just, you know, some indicative rates around that relative to, and we'll dig in later in the presentation to really helping folks on the call be able to do their own due diligence and analysis relative to you know, what the savings may be for your debt and your projects. Um, but those are the two different paths. Um, and digging into those a little bit more in detail, um, path A, if we're taking on additional debt and we're going to do that reinvestment, 
um, as I referenced, you know, typically we're able to combine the direct and guaranteed loans and we recommend as a starting point, um, each project is a little bit different, that 80% of the funding comes through the direct loan program. The current rate for that is 2.125%, so two and an eighth. Um, that can be locked in for up to 40 years in terms of repayment. And then we have 20% on the guaranteed loan side. Um, from an indicative rate perspective, that's about a 4% loan if we take that over on a fixed basis for 30 years. And we, in today's interest rate environment, are very much recommending that applicants um, and clients take uh, the longest fixed rate that we can, that we can get um, because there's no reason for rural hospitals and rural clinics to be uh, playing the market around interest rates, in, in, in our opinion. So if you do the math on that um, and you do the net interest cost, it works out to 2.5%. Um, and it, it really works out to be about a 38 year amortization process. Now, when you go through and actually convert that on a, on a um, you know, per million dollars of finance basis, essentially what this is saying is that we would need $42,000 um, of, uh, each $42,000 of savings uh, relative to our existing debt would support a million dollars of new borrowing and new debt. So you can see there's quite a lever here as it relates to being able to take some of those reinvestments. And frankly, we've seen a lot of these projects, Eric, that you referenced in the rural replacement study where um, critical access hospitals might have you know, moved their facility to a greenfield site done a complete replacement, but at the time that they did that, they didn't necessarily have all of the capital in place to do a medical office building or a clinic building on site. And so, you know, they go through the process and then what we've seen is that there's a subsequent application where uh, we put the clinic in place, uh, refinance, you know, some of our existing debt um, and, and really are able to add on to the facilities over time. And, from a regulation perspective, if you're interested in this level of detail, this is the specific regulation relative to um, being able to do refinancing with existing debt under the 1942 uh, regulations. You kind of see here the same points that uh, we need to make sure that those are refinanced as a secondary part of the total loan. Um, I didn't mention that earlier, and I want to emphasize that, that when we're refinancing and using those savings, that on a dollar for dollar basis under the existing program rules, we need to make sure that the amount that's being invested is more, at least more uh, equal to or more than the amount that's being refinanced. And that's really this 1942 um, set provision one here that says that the debts need to be secondary to the total loan. Um, they need to be incurred for the facilities and services. And then the last point here, is really important and I, I know that we have a number of participants in today's webinar from the agency and leadership levels um, and it's important um, they make it this point um, regularly which is this program is not intended to be competitive with the private market so you know the the USDA is not interested in just simply taking out a bunch of you know other creditors um, and they really do have in their in their regulations a requirement that that there's an effort that's made with existing creditors to extend or modify the terms of the debt so that the sound basis for the loan exists. And if that doesn't happen, then we can fold that into the USDA program. So the new part of this um, aspect, the new part of the, of the program really is around being able to refinance without any new debt. Um, as Eric mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's, it kind of flew below the radar screen for a number of factors. Um, this aspect of the program was originally authorized in December of 2018 as part of the Farm Bill. Um, now, you might also remember for those um, history buffs or political science buffs on the call that this was also essentially the time or just before the time that the government um, had an extended shutdown going into the beginning of 2019. So the Farm Bill passed um, along with the rest of the budget and then the government shut down or didn't pass with the rest of the budget. So the farm bill passed before the budget passed, I'm sorry. And then we had a shutdown for a period of time um, that delayed some of the regulations, but the regulations 
ultimately became issued in July of 2020, so just last year, under a new regulatory initiative called 1RD. And this is really a great aspect of the program because it, it both consolidated and simplified a number of aspects of different programs. And I know Jeremy you know, has done lending in a lot of these different programs, so he could speak to that a lot more than, I, than any of us could probably, but um, you know, really a great aspect. So the regulations associated with that are in a different spot. Um, we need to make sure that the project is viable, um, that the original funds were used for project eligible purposes, and that with the refinanced amounts that the borrowers can demonstrate that there's you know adequate cash available and this is what we would call in banking a covenant which is that we need to make sure that it's at least 1.1 times the debt service requir requirement so in translating out of banker terms that essentially says for every dollar of cash that we know that we have to spend towards our debt service we need to generate an, an additional 10 cents in excess of that and in the banking world that's a what we would call a very a low restrictive covenant so um, many lenders are going to be much higher than that they're going to be up to you know a 120 a 130 or a 140 coverage ratio for example so we see this as being a great aspect of the program to be able to really work with a lot of rural, rural borrowers um, in terms of eligibility um, we know that healthcare is a, an, an eligible community facility under the program. In fact, it is just under half of the existing outstanding loan balance for the program, according to some of the more recent data that we've seen. So the USDA community facilities staff has made a, a huge commitment to healthcare and supporting the development of healthcare across the country. And um, it is along with some other community facilities, you know, really a key aspect of, of the program here. Um, in terms of location, um, we, we need to make sure that, uh, that folks are located in an area that is rural in nature. And to be able to use some of those direct loan dollars, um, the community needs to be 20,000 residents or fewer. Um, but under the 1RD rule, the guaranteed loan community size was actually increased up to 50,000 people. So that is incorporating a heck of a lot more um, uh, geography out there in the, in the United States. So if folks have any questions, the agency also has a great website that's listed here and um, slides will be distributed after the call for every participant. So, uh, you know, this will be available. You can check this out. It's a map um, and, you know, easily put in your address and confirm if you are, you know, that you are in fact eligible. In terms of the use of the funding, um, we need to make sure that any of the refinancing proceeds were originally used for eligible uses. Um, that is essentially buying, you know, acquiring real estate, getting land, constructing, expanding, renovating, or improving facilities, um, purchasing vehicles and other equipment, and then all of the other associated project expenses. So any fees that you pay to a lender, um, certainly legal costs associated with the project. Um, if, you know, at the time that your project was done, th there would be architectural fees, other kinds of engineering fees, et cetera. So all of those are eligible both for the original use and then therefore become eligible for the refinancing use. Um, on the ineligible side, uh, we do know that there are some companies out there that uh, really help applicants assemble application materials and, um, and kind of package loans. Um, those are not eligible uses for the funds, nor are any sources of debt that were originally used for operations. So for example, we have a number of clients that have unfunded pension liabilities. Um, those really are related specifically to operations and um, would not be eligible for use of the community facilities proceeds. Um, there are some other ways that we could finance those, but and similarly, working capital or lines of credit uh, would also not be eligible. Now, the agency is also very um, mindful around the environmental impact of its projects and um, will not fund any projects that disturb wetlands or projects that don't really uh, meet the industry standards about being modest in size, design, or cost. Uh, and there's a review, uh, a thorough review process of that. So 
as we're going through the refinancing, we need to make sure that the original debt falls within the parameters of these eligible uses. Now, in terms of the process, um, you see here on the left-hand side, in terms of a pre-engagement review, uh, one of the things that we like to offer within Scrodwater GCL is the opportunity to help validate eligibility. Um, and then we evaluate five years of historical financials. Uh, one of the wonderful parts of the program is that there is no hard and fast requirement about having X number of years of profitability, um, et cetera. So we want to evaluate those. And if there are questions or concerns, that we have based on USDA's underwriting criteria and um, greater commercial lending's underwriting criteria, then we resolve those on the front end um, because we know what those are and we know kind of where to look for the, you know, the potential problems, so to speak. Uh, we also wanna make sure that we review the existing debt um, in terms of its prepayment ability and if there are any costs associated with the prepayment of those um, debts and we will put together what, a document that we call a sources and uses document, which is really outlining the entire financing package. How much uh, uh, are we retiring in terms of debt? Are there any prepayment penalties associated with that? And then from the uses of funds, um, we also want to look at um, you know, other fees, transaction costs, again, bank fees, um, attorneys, fees, et cetera, um, and we'll go and delineate those in here just a couple moments. So a, a key beginning part of the process is to make sure that we have a feasibility study. You see this is where we bring in um, third parties. Um, in full disclosure, Stroudwater Associates is a third party that does feasibility studies, um, but Stroudwater GCL and Stroudwater Associates are separate companies, um, obviously closely related. So. In some cases, um, the third party report of the feasibility study would be done by Stroudwater Associates. But we also wanna make sure that if clients have an existing relationship with an accounting firm that's qualified to be able to do the required USDA feasibility study that we work with those folks as well. And there are a number of good firms out there that do them. So there's no requirement from our perspective to use Stroudwater for a feasibility study. Um, and then the next really key piece associated with the due diligence process is to take the feasibility study and really combine it with an appraisal. And this is a business appraisal. So it goes far beyond kind of just looking at the value of the, of the real estate itself, but looks at the value overall of the business entity. So it uses the input from the feasibility study and typically we get it started while the feasibility study is in process, as you can see from the timing here. And then it takes usually a couple of weeks after the completion of the feasibility study to get a completed appraisal. Um, as referenced earlier, um, the agency is, is very mindful of the environmental impacts or potential environmental impacts of projects. So we do need to have an environmental review completed. Uh, that can be happening concurrent to the two prior steps. And then really throughout the entire process, we are on behalf of the applicants making sure that we're underwriting, um, you know, that is evaluating the loan package, kind of pulling the different components together really concurrently so that at the end of the day, there are no surprises relative to um, all of the pieces needing to come together that, that come together um, from all of these third parties. And we take about 10 days after the completion of the last third party report for completing that process and then uh, within the next 30 days from the 1RD rules, um, USDA and the agency has defined a 30-day window upon receiving applications that they'll evaluate that application material and then issue the conditional commitment for loan guarantee associated with that. So if we total all of these kind of timelines up, at least the critical path, we, we kind of get to 100 days. So from start to finish, we can have the refinancing um, completed within 100 days, and that includes all of the third parties. And to give a little bit more color commentary on um, the banker's perspective about the importance of these third party reports, I'm gonna have Jeremy go through the next slide. Um, so Jeremy, you wanna take it from here? I will, thank you, Brian. So when you look at the costs and, and just a couple of these items into as far as when they actually need to be finished, 
we'll walk through. There are a couple of USDA items on the guaranteed side, at least, that are sticking points where an application cannot be submitted prior to the, those items being completed. There are, for example, the appraisal, we can receive a conditional commitment on the guaranteed side of the, of the, of the USDA 1RD contingent on an acceptable appraisal. But when you're looking at our uh, retainer, you see the cost of $5,000. That is because if you notice on the left-hand side of the previous deck, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of effort that goes into uh, what we're doing, putting together the capital stacks, putting together the projected financials with you so that, that way you have a positive outcome on your feasibility study. And that's really what all of that information is derived for, is to get us to that point of a structuring, at least a tentative structure so that we can move into the feasibility study, study stage. So you have an examination level financial feasibility study. Um, those in this instance would actually be made out to Greater Commercial Lending and or Greater Nevada Credit Union. So Stroudwater is an appropriate third party. Uh, they are approved by Greater Commercial Lending and Greater Nevada Credit Union, so they can be used for, for any of these types of items that they would perform this, the duties of because it is not going to Stroudwater GCL. It is being addressed directly to Greater Commercial Lending and Greater Nevada Credit Union. There are instances where we can use an existing if it is current. However, it would have to be reassigned uh, over to our, in our institution. Uh, the appraisal, um, that's after the feasibility study because it's gonna have, a, again, a, like Brian mentioned, a projected cash flow, a projected value based upon what our feasibility study comes back with, with either the expansion and or the operational cost savings. So that takes place after the feasibility study is completed. Um, the environmental studies, this is a no-go if this is not completed with the USA. This is the number one sticking point on any, on any groundbreaking project. Uh, an existing, um, you know, if you have an existing environmental and, the, and there has been no real change to um, the, the footprint or the structure, and it's just a straight rate term refinance on the guaranteed side, uh, we may be able, to be able to use an existing environmental with a reassignment. Uh, however, any anytime you break dirt, um, we need to know in advance, and we need to know this. And the environmental study needs to happen before any type of groundbreaking takes place. So it's important to know: don't turn a shovel until this is completed, because this could invalidate the environmental and cause several issues uh, down the road. But this has to be done with the feasibility study in order to, at least on the guaranteed side, receive a uh, conditional commitment from the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, you have the Stroud Water GCL application processing and underwriting commitment. Uh, this is because we go through an in-depth process. We take all of these items together uh, and we create what's called a credit analysis and that goes to the USDA. Uh, these folks, you know, excluding any type of financial um, documents and or um, projections, they, the folks, these are 120 pages worth of documentation where we take a deep dive into your business. We take a deep dive into the management of the business and the operations. And we actually dissect all of these reports and bring them back together into one. So you have the USDA review. Uh, that is um, there again, one and a half percent of that application. So you have your total out of pocket commitment or prior to commitment. Um, you see there anywhere between uh, 130 to $150,000 plus one and a half percent of the loan for the USDA fee. Um, when you're looking at fees, it's important to realize that in the direct component, there's also a construction component with these. And historically, there has not been a lot of construction financing available outside of the bond market. Well, what happens if your community cannot, cannot end up with a bond rating high enough to move it to the secondary market? Your fees go up. So one of the items that we've done is Stroudwater GCL, Stroudwater and GCL, is we've created a construction product this is a fraction of the cost of the bond market so that you can actually obtain your construction finance here. So a lot of these fees could be absorbed through the savings that you're gonna receive during the construction period that you're not gonna receive, that you wouldn't receive going through the bonding process. All right, Brian, next slide. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, and I just wanna highlight um, two, two things on this, Jeremy. Um, number one, the asterisk associated with our fees, just lost that. Um, is that our we have skin in the game relative to this process that we're not uh, other than the five thousand dollars you know up front uh, we're not asking for um, 
a, a whole bunch of fees through the process and up front and we're really you know our fees are really contingent upon getting a successful commitment in place um, which then kind of leads to how do we know if this is worth it and we wanted to leave uh, the presentation here and then we'll be having plenty of time for some discussion questions and answers from folks on the call um, but really understand how to translate all of this information into what Eric and I have affectionately called in the past a 12-figure quickie. You know, this is not a very thorough analysis, but um, using the back of the envelope, how do we understand if this is going to make sense on a straight refinance perspective? And the place that we start with that is really by understanding that when we're talking a straight refinance, so this is path B, we're not investing new capital um, and going through, you know, some of the benefits that Jeremy just mentioned around um, you know, construction, financing, et cetera. But if we just focus 100% on a refinance, the ballpark estimate would be to use $61,000 of annual debt service for every $1 million of outstanding debt that you have on your books. That would be the, your new number. Um, so in terms of evaluating the impact, we pulled together a quick case study here so to use some nice easy round numbers, if we had a $10 million loan uh, outstanding, and if that the rate on that was 6.5%, the annual debt service associated with that loan would be $758,000. Now, in order to look at what it would be like under USDA, we'll take this $61,000 per 1 million of outstanding debt, um, multiply that times 10 as 10 you know, per 1 million, to come up with a new debt service number of 610,000, we compare that back to the 758,000 um, that we're paying currently, we, you can see that we'll net $148,000 of annual savings. This is assuming a reamortization of that same loan. Um, now, when we take that importantly and put it into some perspective of what is it gonna take for us to place this financing, you know, as Jeremy just went through, we've got Stroudwater and other third-party fees, um, you know, of about $150,000 on the conservative end. We've got the fees associated um, that, that Jeremy also referenced with placing the loan, um, doing the due diligence and the underwriting. And when we combine both of those, we kind of come up to somewhere in the ballpark of $305,000. And so if we compare that to the annual savings of 148,000, you can see that we're somewhere in, in you know, just over a two year payback period from a return on investment perspective. Um, so again, high level, um, 12 figure quickie, anybody on the call that you, know, you can look up this information within your own financials um, and get a sense. Um, and again, all of this is you know, very high level and indicative from a pricing perspective. But with that, um, Benson, we'll be opening up the floor for any questions that folks have relative to the um, to the presentation today. Sure. And, and actually, I can compliment you that there was one question that came up, and in the next slide, you answered it. So that uh, that had already covered it. But the one outstanding question at the moment, and obviously, if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to type them in now. But the question was, if wetlands had been mitigated through a prior HUD loan financing. Would a refinance with USDA be eligible? Jeremy, do you want to take that one? Yeah, if you've if you've mitigated the the wetlands and you have documentation to show that and prove that, and that would be you know sourced through an existing environmental and you're not disturbing any new type of ground, it very well could potentially be used. Great. And then I can tell you the, the question that you had answered was, someone said, we are currently looking at refinancing our bond. We've been talking to the USDA office here locally to refinance our bond. We have to come up with, or excuse me, to refinance our bond, do we have to come up with the same amount of new money? Is that still the same? And you had answered that in, uh, in your slides. And so they said, thanks, answered the question. So I don't know if there's anything more you wanna add on uh, expanding on that. Uh, Brian, yeah, I, I think you know, I, yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, two questions for you. And um, 
The first is that you know, I hear a lot of people say, gosh, you go through USDA, there's a lot of leaps and, and, and bounds you got to cross. It often takes a year or more. Um, has something changed or is there is a process just been streamlined where you've been able to, to, to reduce some of that time frame and some of those hurdles? Yeah, I mean, you have to look at historically prior to 1D. Go ahead. Right. Historically, no, go ahead, prior, I, we're, historically I prior to 1RD, it has been a direct program for the most part without the availability of the guaranteed program. It's been a very small and been kind of in the backlight of the of the direct program. You, again, in the old reg, there was a lot of regulatory hurdles on the direct side, a very, very limited amount of staffing mm -hmm. on the direct side. Um, and while they, they did move efficiently, they moved efficiently, USDA did, mind you, with the staff that was available to process the credits as they came in. Now with 1RD and you're looking at a, a direct guaranteed combo, remember the guaranteed portion of it is lender driven. Okay. So now you need to think of the efficiency and the expediency of having a lender drive the process and assist the USDA on the direct side in order to move it much more quickly in working with the client setting up the call so you actually have more of a team it's more of a collaborative effort now than it has been in the past and that helps drive the process efficiencies and the usda did a very very wonderful job of laying that out in the new 1rd rig so, so essentially a public yeah, private and, and add, so i think it's kind of a both and situation eric and i think jeremy's completely correct that the change within 1RD was really a super positive change in terms of the underlying regulations. And then the leadership that, you know, really for a number of years within USDA has been encouraging public-private partnerships, you know, it's very thematically consistent with that. But the other thing that I would just offer from our experience is that developing these projects, you know, setting aside the refinancing itself for just a moment, developing any project um, within the healthcare space with you know super tight margins, um, you know, with not a lot of <clears throat> track record within healthcare of, of doing you know big big capital projects, as evidenced by you know your replacement study slides. That <clears throat> there are a lot of different um, pitfalls, so to speak, in the process. And one of the best practices really is to be able to tie the pieces together. So. I mentioned earlier um, that within USDA that there are multiple areas of review and, uh, and um, um, you know, concurrence relative to the process. And <clears throat> what we've observed is that if if applicants are putting in um, you know pro projects that aren't consistent with the underwriting criteria, or if there are inconsistencies among all of those third-party reports because they weren't talking to each other. When they were doing their work there wasn't a coordinated process etc then essentially what ends up happening is it'll work through the process to the point where somebody is responsible for reviewing that aspect you know they'll kick the application back and then you know there's frustration because it feels like you know it's bureaucratic or you know insert whatever characterization there is there but really the responsibility is to make sure that these packages are are really done well in the front end and as jeremy jeremy just referenced that from a lender perspective that the lender makes a very clear analysis and recommendation and shares all of that with the agency and underneath that public private partnership commitment that the agency has it, it all works but yeah. there you know again there are lots of folks out there that um you know are uh, very well intentioned and you know aren't necessarily as experienced in the program itself and so we might get some things kicked back because you know again the t's weren't crossed and the i's weren't dotted exactly correctly with the regulations yeah. and then that becomes you know somehow you know it somehow it, the, the finger gets pointed i guess is what i would say so but i appreciate you characterizing that eric is One last question. Other questions, Benson? Yes, there was a question about is the fixed USDA refinance rate of 4.5% still a good number? Is this a set rate with no room for higher or lower rates? The guaranteed number is actually lender driven, and that's a that's a great Nevada, question. Actually, it's a Greater Nevada yeah. Credit Union number, and that does fluctuate with the Treasury rate. 
So okay. that's currently an indicative rate, and that's why we call it an indicative rate because it will fluctuate back and forth depending on the treasury. Okay, thank you. And then this was specifically for Jeremy while you're up and in front. The uh, With the change in the administration's leadership under President Biden, what do you feel is the government's support for the USDA program? Oh, good one. That's a, that's a great one. Um, you know, I, I do like the government support underneath this program, especially the community facilities program. But if you look at the emphasis that this administration and, you know, our Secretary Vilsack has put onto rural communities in general, I look for I look forward to working with this administration and from an agricultural standpoint, which this program falls under, Vilsack, Secretary Vilsack is not new to us. He was a Secretary of Agriculture under Obama. So we do have some historical data on, on what we would perceive the go forward methodology would be. Um, and of course, you also have a supportive Ag Appropriations Committee in both the House and the Senate. Um, and that, that you see with a monumental farm bill that came out in 2018, a lot of those all of the distinguished ladies and gentlemen are still on that Ag Appropriations Committee. So now you have the Ag Appropriations Committee, the Senate and the House, as well as the administration from a secretary or from a secretary of agriculture standpoint working in hand. So I, you know, if it's resonant of anything um, in the 2008, 9, 12, you know, that era, era um, you're going to see a lot of great things coming from the USDA. We're, we're looking very forward to it. Well, great. Thank you. And now one for Brian. Uh... There's a question, would you speak to your mission and how you and Jeremy are aligned and focused on your missions? Absolutely. Um, well, I think that ties back in some ways to what Eric started out our presentation with, which is we understand that there have been a lot of uh, communities across rural America that have had new facilities invested, but there's just a lot of work to be done. So our mission really is to make sure that we support and help develop all of these projects to invigorate rural communities, to make sure that their local economies are supported through healthcare, and that we do that at the best possible rates that we can by taking um, a lot of the factors that are outside of the local healthcare system's control by taking those off, off the table, like interest rates, for example. And referenced earlier that we see a lot of lenders within the program who are not comfortable making long-term fixed interest rate commitments. And so really one of the major aspects of being able to partner with Jeremy and, and the team at Greater Commercial Lending is that they are committed to aligning around our customers' needs for long-term committed capital. And um, then tying that back to, um, again, Stroudwater's historical mission of supporting um, good strategic and operational um, projects in communities that really make a difference in terms of reducing the number of folks that you know leave the community unnecessarily taking their healthcare dollars to a, a, an urban or a suburban community that's adjacent to them and and really you know keeping healthcare dollars local and one of the other aspects of that that wasn't necessarily a part of this presentation Benson is that um, Jeremy and, and our team were able to also involve local lenders um, in our projects through participation agreements through this financing so that you know all the interest rate dollars aren't going to uh, Jeremy and to the credit union but in fact you know some of those can be shared back with the community um, through participation agreements so there's multiple levels of what we're trying to accomplish but at the end of the day Benson is it's about making sure that we support rural health care with capital for the first time in many many years and really utilize the great program that the uh, that the USDA has created and the leadership that they've shown to support many rural communities help make sure that that gets promoted and utilized efficiently within the marketplace excellent well, thank you very much. And like that to seems to be all the Jeremy. questions we had, unless Eric, you've got another one you want to throw no, in the I'd last like five minutes. Jeremy's, per Jeremy's perspective on that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, this this coming together is really what GCL was founded on. And that's supporting rural out migration from rural communities into urban markets. And, during, and as a leader of the business and industry um, lending program, uh, we did that through unemployment, keeping unemployment rates low, keeping manufacturing jobs in rural America. Now with the pandemic, we see 
the urban out migration back into rural markets. It is, we deem it as our responsibility and our duty um, to also provide the infrastructure needed to support those jobs that are coming back into there. And we've been in, in speaking with Brian and Eric prior to this, noticing rural health deserts and, and things like that. And, you know, driving an hour and a half, you know, to receive health care. That's just really not what we're about. We're about helping rural communities thrive. That's providing business opportunities. But with business opportunities, in, in order to attract those business opportunities, you need infrastructure, health care, education, wastewater, sewer, roads. And that's what we do at GCL, is we focus on rural and underserved communities from the ground up. Excellent. Well, that's everything we have from, from the audience today. And so any final comments before we shut it down? Thanks everybody for listening. And thanks to everybody for participating. Great. Thanks again. Thank you.